Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mav Gonzalez, and I will be your host for today. I hope we are all ready and excited for a productive afternoon. Welcome to All Hands on Deck, ensuring the health and wellness of Filipino seafarers and vessel passengers in the time of COVID-19. This event was organized by the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, Top Notch Medical Boards Prep, and the Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity of the UP College of Medicine. In this event, we will be treated to three relevant topics, all of which will be discussed by our speakers later, who are experts in their various fields. First, we are going to discuss the clearances that must be secured prior to maritime travel. Then, the infection control measures once you are on board the ship. And finally, we are going to discuss the different local and national protocols that cover maritime travel during the At the end of our program, we will allot our remaining time to an open forum, so please feel free to ask our speakers any question you might have during this time. With that behind us, we will start with the Philippine National Anthem. <laughs> denied that COVID-19 has affected all aspects of our lives. So we approach our work, schooling, travel, even dates, and the simplest things such as doing the grocery have been changed as our nation currently battles this pandemic. And sadly, this seems to be our reality for at least the next few months. And this same reality is even more apparent for our seafarers and passengers aboard maritime vessels where there's a higher risk of infection. And this is why it's very important that we have proper protocols and clearances in place to ensure that we can continue with our work and travel without compromising our safety. And now to officially start our program, may I call on the President of the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, Attorney Beatriz Heronilia Villegas. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Secretary Carla Negrales, co-chairperson of the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Our distinguished doctors and speakers, Dr. Tony Abaya, Dr. Desi Roman, and Dr. Alberto Ong Jr. Top-notch medical board prep inc. led by Dr. Brolly Benzella, as well as Dr. Mark Denver Townsend. 
the leadership of Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity of the UP College of Medicine, led by Press Mayavirai, Superior Exemplar, his officers and his Council of Advisors and esteemed Alumni Brotherhood. The Board of Trustees and Executive Officers, the Executive Committee of the All Hands on Deck 2020, the Advisory Board and members of the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines. We acknowledge the health sector, our medical frontliners who are watching us live. Viewers from the Office of the President, the IATF, various affiliate government agencies, the DOTR, Marina, Philippine Ports Authority, Philippine Coast Guard, POEA, NLRC, OWA, Philippine Navy, Judiciary, the bench and the bar, not to mention the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, the Maritime League, most especially the Filipino seafarers and passengers. Good afternoon. In keeping with our organization's thrust to educate stakeholders and raise their awareness on relevant maritime issues, Marla is sponsoring a virtual event series entitled Navigating Uncharted Waters, Philippine Government Agency's Response to COVID-19, an Outlook on a Post-Pandemic Marine and Maritime World. This event is intended to increase awareness on the government's response and how it affects the maritime industry. Marlow makes itself relevant by moving a project during the pandemic involving the shipping and manning sectors towards the solution of healing and rehabilitation. Marlow, in this first episode of the virtual event series for this afternoon, proudly presents a virtual symposium entitled All Hands on Deck, Ensuring the Health and Wellness of Filipino Seafarers and Vessel Passengers in the Time of COVID-19. It is with great pride that we present this offering a first in the history of our organization that a partnership of maritime lawyers and doctors and health professionals synergize forces for one mission, which is to save lives, promote public health, and revitalize the maritime industry. How do we reclaim our lives? This question was the inspiration of this endeavor. This project came to fruition through the magnanimity of Dr. Bidzuela and Dr. Tiamzan of Top Notch and the leadership of the Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity of UP College of Medicine with Press Mayavirai at the helm. Not to mention the tireless efforts of the All Hands on Deck Executive Committee of Marlow with Attorney Durban, Attorney Masakayan, Attorney De Guzman, and Attorney Cruz. It is the common belief of serving the country through arming every Filipino seafarer and vessel passengers with safety protocols and guidelines with the end of fortifying and strengthening our economy in this present wartime. As we send out every Filipino to sail to deep seas, we are one in believing we are healthy and globally competitive, able and can weather any stormy waters we go through. We in this endeavor believe in a unifying catalyst to empower, to care, and to support. As your president of the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, I thank everyone who believed in this project, most especially you, our viewers. We salute all medical frontliners and health professionals who risk their lives to save, despite the danger of not coming home to see their families. To all maritime frontliners and vessel passengers who are out there in deep seas to earn a living, this is for you. May we all remain in Noah's Ark, so when all has passed, we can share a pandemic story with each other. Please sit back and enjoy this educational afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bea, for that. To know more about Marlo, let us watch this video.
Maritime Law Association of the Philippines Incorporated, or MAR Law, was established in 1982. It aims, among others, to maintain the highest ethical standards in the practice of maritime law in the Philippines. Marlow was formed to help spur progress in the legal practice of the maritime sector. It's affiliated with the Comité Maritime International, a non-governmental, not-for-profit international organization established in Antwerp in 1897, the object of which is to contribute by all appropriate means and activities to the unification of maritime law in all its aspects. Now let us get to know more about top-notch medical board prep in this video. Topnotch was founded in 2007 and was originally created to help the first graduates of San Beda College of Medicine. It then expanded to become the largest physician licensure exam preparatory institution in the country. Through systematic and student-centered methods of teaching, they aim to nurture medical graduates, optimize student performance, and help create future doctors. Presently, they're expanding their program to accommodate clinical clerks and interns, and soon will launch programs to help nurture first-year to third-year medical students. And now to formally introduce the most venerable fraternity of the UP College of Medicine, the Phi Kappa Mu, let us watch this video. As we have seen in the video, the most venerable fraternity of the UP College of Medicine, the Phi Kappa Mu, has been a brotherhood that has fostered among its ranks healthcare professionals who have both excelled and attained key leadership positions in their respective fields. Fittingly, our speakers for today all proudly hail from the Phi Kappa Mu and will shortly impart their knowledge and expertise later to us in the webinar. Now that we have been introduced to all the organizations that made this event possible, we move on to the next part of our program. Our keynote speaker is the current cabinet secretary and is the co-chairperson of the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Carlo is a graduate of Philippine Science High School. He holds a degree in BS Management Engineering from the Ateneo de Manila University and the Juris Doctor from the Ateneo de Manila Law School. Before he was appointed cabinet secretary, Carlo was chair of the House Committee on Appropriations, which approves the national budget of the government. He served as a three-term congressman of the 1st District of Davao City. A lawyer by profession, he previously worked for the Nograles Law Firm in Davao City. Carlo Nograles currently serves as cabinet secretary and works as close advisor to the president and ensures close coordination among the different agencies of government, such as the ILG, DPWH, DSWD, DOH, and others. 
In response to the pandemic, he was appointed as co-chair of the IATF, tasked to formulate policies and plans and to lead all government efforts in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as preparing the country for post-pandemic recovery. Please welcome Cabinet Secretary Carlo Nagrales. Maraming salamat, Max. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Magandang hapon po si lahat. Uh, to my, to our fellow speakers, Dr. Antonio Abaya, Dr. Arthur Desi Roman, Dr. Alberto Ong Jr., to the officers and members of the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, um, led by its president, Attorney Bea Villegas, to the top-notch medical board prep, Incorporated, Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity, the participants, representatives from the domestic shipping industry, lawyers, participants, mga kababayan nating Filipino, seafarers, sa ating pong lahat mayang hapon. I'm honored to be with you all today. The chosen theme for this virtual series revolves primarily on two key terms, namely navigation and COVID-19. Highlighted in the goal of this first installment, of the virtual series, uh, which is to ensure the health and wellness of Filipino seafarers and vessel passengers in this time of pandemic. So at the onset, these key words may seem to be extremes, but in reality, they are intertwined and will eventually determine the outcome of us surviving the pandemic. The ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus claimed that we cannot cross the same river twice. His claim encapsulates the permanency of change in our daily life. In his book, Celestial Navigation, Francis W. Wright, on the other hand, defines navigation as keeping track of the past, present, and future position of a vessel. So this definition attests to the discipline of being constantly vigilant in life and the ability to adapt by ad adjusting to cur current situations. The journey of the maritime industry is similar. It is a constant evolution to respond and to achieve excellence in the industry's performance indicators on trade, cargo handling or supply chain connectivity, maritime transport and port management, among others. However, given the shock that COVID-19 has brought the world we are currently in a voyage to be constantly vigilant and learn how to adapt to the new normal for this industry. So we know that COVID-19 has created a lot of disruptions in the world and the maritime industry is not exempted. It's also been affected due to recent port requirements that uh, require quarantining vessels for up to 14 days before they enter the destination port, depending on where their last, whether their last port visit was a high infected country. This in effect led to tremendous impact on global trade, supply chains and commerce due to vessels being held for 14 days before exchanging of goods can begin. This slowdown is in addition to developments in the world economy and trade activity, which actually in 2018 will show that international maritime trade lost momentum. Trade volumes expanded at a slow pace of negative 2.7% in 2018, down from 4.1% in 2017. This was attributed to trade ten trend tensions, protectionism, followed by the decision of the United Kingdom or Brexit, the geopolitical turmoil and the supply side disruption, such as those occurring in the oil sector, in addition to heightened trade tensions between China and the United States of America. Now, all of that compounded with the COVID-19 pandemic will really have a slow down effect in the maritime industry. So we in the government obviously understand 
that the country's maritime industry is a vital component to attaining inclusive growth and our, for our social economic progress. Hence, to provide continuity to this very vital role, government has actually incorporated in its COVID-19 response the maritime industry sectors, namely how we take care of our sea-based and land-based subsectors, which encompass the country's core capabilities in shipping and fishing operations, how we respond with regard to port management or maritime ancillary business or maritime education and training and maritime administration. So allow me then to provide you some of the programs in relation to these core capabilities of the country's maritime industry. So in terms of providing health standards for domestic and passenger vessels, the Department of Transportation has actually required the wearing of face shields for passengers using public transportation beginning last August 15. This is in line with the global health standards and measures that government has taken to curb the spread of the virus. In addition to this, the Philippine Maritime Industry Authority or Marina has issued several advisories touching on COVID-19 health and safety measures, such as uh, Marina Advisory Number 2020-04, which is actually um, advising ship owners and ship operators to incorporate in their safety management system measures that address capacitating the officers and crew on board and offshore personnel with knowledge, information, and skills necessary for the monitoring, reporting, and prevention of NCOV. This was as early as January of 2020. Another advisory by the Marina had to do with the PPE recommendations by the World Health Organization, as well as an interactive online course, operational considerations for managing COVID-19 cases and outbreaks on board ships. Another marina advisory was uh, related uh, to the guide in establishing safety control measures and reducing risk and ensuring a safe shipboard interface between ship and shore-based personnel. Still another is what I mentioned earlier on the wearing of face shields for, pas for passengers which in part also states that all shipping companies, owners, and operators shall strictly comply with the rules and regulations and protocols of the government in the implementation of community quarantine on board ships, such as but not limited to physical and social distancing measures. As to occupational safety, the government recognizes that safety in the workplace is paramount and aligns its strategies in consideration that protection of workers in the workplace is one of the three pillars to fight COVID-19 based on international labor standards. And this is implemented in part with the strengthening of the occupational safety and health measures. Such safety mindset is incorporated in each seafarer's contracts as standard requirements as prescribed by the POEA. And then in guaranteeing the health and safety of Filipino seafarers, the Philippine Interagency Task Force or the IETF issued omnibus guidelines on the implementation of community quarantine in the Philippines, which actually directed government offices and agencies involved in the processing of the deployment of OFWs to establish green lanes to enable the prompt processing and deployment of OFWs. Likewise, the Department of Foreign Affairs, DOH, DOJ, DOLE, and DILG, as well as the Department of Transportation issued Joint Circular Number 1 Series of 2020 prescribing the responsibilities of licensed manning agencies or shipping principals for providing for the appropriate COVID-19 testing to its seafarers, as well as meals, accommodations, and transportation from point of hire to intended destinations as conditions required. The Philippine Green Lane for seafarers is intended to ensure 
the speedy and safe travel of Filipino seafarer to stimulate Philippine economy at the time of COVID-19 pandemic and to control the risk of spreading the coronavirus by managing the movement of seafarers traveling by ship or plane. And then to complement this, guidelines for joining Filipino seafarers to ship dock in the country or overseas provide for procedures on testing the necessary accommodations and the necessary accommodations while waiting for results and logistic arrangement to, to facilitate embarkation. Now, on to the fishing sector. In 2017, the fishing sector of the maritime industry reports continuous growth in number and capacity. Actually, 81,093 fishing vessels were registered and shipping operation accounts for 14% or 2.56 million gross tons of the total capacity of registered vessels in the country. So given these figures, the sector's contribution to employment and agriculture um, through commercial and municipal operations is seen uh, in our different aquatic produce circulated all over the country. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, it has also experienced a shock due to the impositions of community quarantine resulting to restrictions on economic opportunities. So to augment for the displaced workers' income in the sector, government through the Bayanihan II has allotted 24 billion pesos to provide direct cash or loan in interest rate subsidies under the programs of the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Credit Policy Council, and other forms of 47 types of assistance to qualified agri-fishery enterprises and fisher folk registered under the registry for the basic sectors in agriculture or RSBA. Another intervention is through Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines, which has been directed to prioritize agri-fishery in the availment of low interest or flexible term loan programs for operating expenses available for businesses affected by COVID-19 pandemic. The provision of extension support, direct cash or loan interest, rate subsidy or other forms of assistance to qualified agri-fishery enterprises and fisher folk will also be provided through the Department of Agriculture. And as part of our sustainability beyond the Bayanian II, local governments are actually also allowed, uh, together with national governments, of course, to directly purchase fishery products from fisher folk and agricultural, agriculture cooperatives as a form of direct assistance um, to our small fisher folk organizations, as can be seen and in accordance with the Sagip Saka Act. Now on to the ports. Of course, we all know that ports play an integral role in the management of cargoes and personnel. They serve as points of entry to maintain a steady supply chain and transportation of individuals to their destinations. Uh, bearing this in mind, government through the Philippine Ports Authority is tasked to, to maximize the use of ports all over the country as a response mechanism to COVID-19. And this includes coordinating with the uh, different LGUs to enjoin uh, the unhampered transit of OFWs who have been issued DOH or LGU certification of completion of their 14-day facility-based quarantine and allow the docking of maritime vessels in their ports in those LGUs, as well as to allow the disembarkation and transit of these OFWs to their ultimate destination in the country. And that can be found in the IATF resolution number 22. In addition to this, IATF resolution number 24 states and provides that foreign cruise ships carrying Filipino crew shall be allowed to dock in the ports of Manila and to be used as a quarantine facility for said Filipino crew members subject to the guidelines to be issued by our sub-task group 
on the repatriation of overseas Filipino workers. Further, foreign crew on board these foreign cruise ships shall be allowed to disembark in Manila for the sole purpose of taking outbound flights to their final destination abroad. So this facilitates the movement of people to their destinations in view of the strict health protocols that have been issued by the IATF. Again, in consideration of maintaining the flow of supply chains, seaports are allowed to continue to operate to ensure the unhampered movement of goods which is needed as part of our country's COVID-19 response. Next in maritime education and training. Um, there is now an industry-wide effort, no? and, and this really plays a crucial role uh, in maintaining a safe shipping environment vis-a-vis -vis the protocols and standards in this pandemic. So observing the high standards of competence and professionalism is actually an imperative for the maritime industry to survive in this pandemic, given that seafarers duties, um, the, they perform duties on board their ships and even when they are off board. So the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification and Watchkeeping for seafarers um, sets those standards. Uh, and its provisions not only apply to seafarers, but also to sea owners, training establishments, and the National Maritime Administration. So this high regard on excellence is key in the implementation of protocols and response mechanisms to COVID-19. And this is assured by the Marina by being granted the continuance of certification to ISO 9001-2015 for its head office, as well as it in its satellite offices. Through Marina's STCW office, policies and procedures are established for its stakeholders. And more specifically, this covers the provisions on training, certification, and assess assessment system for Filipino seafarers to certify that they are well-educated, well-trained, and well-equipped with knowledge and competencies aligned with national and international standards in order to develop them into a globally competitive seafaring workforce. So with this, Marina assures the public that it will continue to integrate the development, promotion, and regulation of the maritime industry in the country, providing safer people, safer ships, cleaner environment, even in this time of the pandemic. So as you can see, our responses and actions to sustain the viability of the maritime industry sees to it that its sectors are provided the necessary programs to alleviate the effects of this pandemic. Government understands the role of the industry in international trade and ultimately in the country's economy. The scene as one of the countries, one of the industries um, that can contribute to economic recovery, particularly Filipino seafarers who have significantly contributed an estimated 30.1 billion US dollars worth of remittances. Also, we must remember that the Philippines is a key player in the maritime transport as it provides the largest number of seafarers serving the world's merchant and cruise fleets. The worldwide population of seafarers serving on international trading merchant ships is estimated at 1,647,500, of which 774,000 are officers and 873,500 are ratings. The Philippines is the biggest supplier of ratings and the second biggest supplier of officers. So sustaining it in these times is immensely important. Another component of the maritime industry is obviously um, shipbuilding and ship repair, where we want our country to play a bigger role. In support to the ship boat requirements of shipping and fishing companies, shipbuilding and ship repair business operates and maintains 118 shipyards, 89 boat yards, 75 afloat repairs, and eight ship breakers in the country, which are registered and licensed with the marina. This sector obviously caters to different classes of ships depending on their length, gross tonnage, purpose, usage, 
and only three shipyards engage mainly in shipbuilding operations, all of which are actually owned by foreign companies such as uh, Tsuneishi, Heavy Industries of Japan, Hanjin, Heavy Industries of Korea, and Austal, Philippines of Australia. These shipyards cater to export-oriented shipbuilding projects involving bulk carrier, container ships, and tankers. And that's for Tsuneishi and Hanjin, while Austal um, focus on aluminum high-speed crafts. So we recognize that this sector may be critical in jumpstarting the maritime industry. And coupled with competent and professional seafarers, a Philippine-controlled and owned shipbuilding facility will definitely complete the two, side of two sides of the equation in the maritime industry, manpower and maritime infrastructure. This business model is part of our country's Build, Build, Build program. As announced last year, the Department of Transportation and the Philippine Ports Authority has plans to actually construct a 300 million peso shipbuilding facility. And our aim is to build one design or one type of passenger vessel, either a roll-on, roll-off vessel or a fast craft. And we aim to produce as much as possible, as much of these as possible to replace our old and unsafe vessels, such as our wooden hull bankas. And DOTR hopes to, to jumpstart this program pretty soon. So it will be a one-stop shop for shipbuilding and repair. And the vision for this facility is to house multiple manufacturers with expertise in building different parts of a ship. So it will be an assembly line which consists of multiple manufacturers that are not competing against each other but are actually supporting one another. Obviously, this infrastructure will boost both employment, maritime ancillary business, improve efficiency in fishing and the marine transport sector, um, and eventually uh, modernize our fleet of boats. So let me cap my talk as we move forward uh, by leaving you with a quote from Ella Maylock, who says that the sooner we learn to be jointly responsible, the easier the sailing will be. Perhaps you've heard this dictum, but it is, I believe, timely in our current situation. We know that we are in turbulent times, or as we say we're in uh, uncharted waters. Nonetheless, as to any crisis, working together facilitates recovery and resiliency. COVID-19 provides us a reminder that in order for us to uplift the maritime industry, it is key to always look at our compass to see where we are headed, to adjust our sails, and ultimately work together to reach our final destination. With this, we will recover as one. Maraming maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Secretary Nograles, for that keynote speech. It's really good to see the government's efforts in helping the maritime sector, especially during this time of COVID-19. And it's also good to see that we have programs in place in case another pandemic, knock on wood, uh, hits the Philippines again. And now we are ready to start the seminar proper. And this afternoon, we have invited three speakers to share their knowledge and expertise in the different aspects of COVID-19, which are relevant to our seafarers and vessel passengers. Our first lecturer will talk about the importance of pre-employment clearance, especially during the time of COVID-19. To talk on this topic, we have invited Dr. Antonio Roberto Abaya. Dr. Antonio Roberto M. Abaya is a UP College of Medicine graduate who completed his residency in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery at the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain, and his fellowship in cardiac surgery at the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium. He then pursued a master's degree in maritime medicine from the University of Cadiz, as well as further studies in occupational health and safety from the UP Institute of Public Health. 
In the past, he has served as a medical director of Health Metrics Incorporated and is now serving as its chief medical officer while being part of the visiting consultant staff of Asian Hospital and Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Toby Abaya. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, Doc. Okay, let me share my screen now. Can I have control of the screen? Can you see my screen now, Mom? Yes, Doc, we can, Paul. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you to the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines and to Top Notch for inviting me for this webinar. Um, maritime health and seafarers' health is actually an advocacy of mine, having worked with seafarers for almost 25 years. Um, I like the term we use when we say uh, we are in uncharted waters because um, this slide clearly shows how uncharted we are. Uh, the PME is what we is the acronym for what we call for the pre-employment medical exam. Most of the time, this is the last hurdle. This is the stumbling block. By definition, when seafarers come to us, they already have a job and they have a contract and they just have to pass the physical exam. And that's why we are being given a nervous look every time they come in. Will I pass, will I not? Therefore, in our clinic, we've actually had some basic rules. And I tell my doctors, this is how we start. You see, our goal is really to get you guys on board the ship to do your work. To prove it to you, we do that 98% of the time. And this is just, not just a number I throw away uh, just for the heck of it. We've actually looked at the PME results of over 300,000 seafarers from eight different clinics. And we came up with that number. 98% of the seafarers actually pass their pre-employment medical exams. And this year, from May to September, when um, crew change was allowed, we've actually had um, a 98.6% fitness rates, only 1.1 are failing. So it's it, it shown that, you know, the numbers are still pre-COVID level, a great number are passing. And one would say when you have a 99% or 98% passing, you would easily say, ah, the teacher is just passing everyone. Easy to say, and yeah, that's a valid conclusion. However, we wanted to back this up. If 99% of the seafarers pass, how fit are they really? So five years ago, we published this study where um, we looked at uh, 6,759 repatriation cases in a five-year period. This over 388,000 deployments during which we recorded for those past five years. This led to a simple division of uh, numerator over denominator and we found out that the repatriation rate of Filipinos is 1.7%. In other words, of the 99% or 98% that we passed, only 1.7% came home for illnesses. Two conclusions basically is that uh, the seafarer, the Filipino seafarer knows how to take care of himself while on board. Um, and we're screening them well. They know how to manage their own illnesses, whether they be diabetes, hypertension, or other lifestyle diseases. And 
surely enough, we can say that they are healthy and they're world-class and really capable of taking care of their own health needs. Now, basically there are three classes of pre-employment medical exams, those determined by the flag states, those determined by the ship owners or the manning agencies, and those determined by the PNI clubs. From left to right, it gets more complicated. The simplest pre-employment medical exams are those by the IMO and the standards in the flag states, followed by added tests when the ship owners and the manning agencies make their own rules and becomes more comprehensive when you do the PNI clubs, the insurance companies of all ships. So different levels of pre-employment medical exams show the way we screen for patients. Now, lately, more and more shipping companies are making different sorts of rules with regards to um, the lifestyle diseases, meaning if patients are more complicated, we'd rather not have them on board. And with reason, because of the higher risk, we know that those with um, hypertension, diabetes, and all other lifestyle diseases get more complicated should they ever get COVID. And therefore, they're preempting, they're telling us to watch out for them. For me, after all these years, this would be the ideal components of a pre-employment medical exam for a seafarer. It's labor intensive. It's a job that requires strength, requires physical ability, endurance, and mental health. So we believe that besides all the, the other biochemical tests that you do, whether they be your sugar test and all the other tests, these are components which are important for a really healthy seafarer. Sadly, um, we don't have tests for all of these. There are some basic tests we do, but I wish we could do more about all these other components. The basic issues we're seeing with the seafarers even now are basically these four, which comprise more than 50% of all the issues why people get delayed or get held back. They have abnormal blood chemistries, whether they're cholesterols or sugars, their blood pressures and control. Some people have cardiovascular disease and need specialist consultation. And we still have a lot of patients with abnormal urine findings. And this is usually in the group working in the engine room because of their higher risk, which we have proven for kidney stones. So we do all this and we think we're ready to go. Or are you? We live in a COVID-19 pandemic world now. And therefore, before they go on board right now, the rules are different. They still have to undergo COVID-19 tests. So briefly, let me tell you what they are. The most, the gold standard is the RT-PCR test, which is a swab up your nose and into your throat where they look for the DNA or the RNA of the virus, looking for its actual existence from the swab taken off you. This is usually a long, uh, test done in a special laboratory. And these are the standard tests required when you travel. Of note, now coming out are the rapid antigen tests. These tests take uh, 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes to analyze. And what they're looking for is the protein, a specific protein of the virus, which actually causes um, a reaction to form antibodies. We'll get to that shortly. So it's a, another swab. And after mixing it with a buffer solution, you put it in a little cartridge where a reaction shows if you have the antigen present. Nowadays, they're so, seeing it very sensitive, especially for those with symptoms. And lastly, what happened, uh, what we started off many months ago was the blood test, the one drop, two drop, 
rapid antibody testing. This basically says and tells you if you had the disease. So that briefly shows you the different kinds of tests we have. But right now, it's all about the PCR, the real-time uh, polymerase chain reaction test. What have we seen so far? We've been testing um, seafarers uh, from May to September. And we've seen pretty high um, numbers, well, low numbers in relation to what we've seen, but we've seen an increase in the positivity rates. So from May, it was 1.4, and it slowly increased to more than 3% by the end of September. More and more people are testing positive, maybe because as we open the economy, more people are traveling and there's more community transfer, especially in the NCR. So right now, even if you pass, 3% of the guys will not be able to go on board because they're COVID positive and they would have to wait another 14 days or for the next available crew change, whichever comes first. So the changes we've seen are the traveling. So you live in an airport where you're quarantined and when you get on board, uh, sorry, when you get to your port of destination, which are very few at this point, uh, you still have to be quarantined sometimes and you still have to be retested most of the time. So they require a test when you leave and they require a test when the seafarer gets to his port of destination or a further quarantine of 14 days. So finally, our seafarer gets on board. It's a new normal. Even on board, they're wearing masks. They're doing protection. But things are also different on board because on the first 14 days, these guys are usually quarantined. They have separate dining quarters. They wash their clothes separately when they work. They're noticed as the newbies and they have to live a quarantined life, not mingling with the rest of the crew for 14 days, unless they've had a test already, which was negative prior to that. But the world is a little more complicated now and everybody is just very cautious. So that's what's happening when you go on board. Now you do your job. Those guys are really working hard and we always advise, these are the healthy habits always. We have to eat right. You've got to have some, some form of exercise. You have to hydrate a lot, especially those working in the engine room. You have to quit smoking, which is another advocacy of mine and limit your alcohol consumption. So this has, and, and then finally, of course, is to get a lot of rest and a lot of sleep. This is all for your physical fitness, keeping you and your body fit for the six months of grueling hard work that these guys take while on board. Over the past few years, many ship owners, many shipping organizations, and many P&I clubs have brought up the topic of mental health at sea. They've seen a steady increase in the number of cases ranging from depression, stress, anxiety, and even suicides on board. And they have reached out and tried to say that this is an important aspect of keeping healthy on board but there are still stigmas. The, there is still a macho, machismo, you know, culture on board. There is the fear of losing your job should you declare you are feeling depressed or feeling anxious about your work. What we've seen in the past few months is really a focus on, 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 on COVID-19, all the illnesses, but even in the land-based area, because of lockdowns and quarantines, it's undocumented, but I'm sure, and there are more reports coming out of increased mental health issues with everyone caused by this pandemic. So mental health becomes more critical. And 
I'd like to take a few more minutes dealing and talking about this um, topic, since this is something rather new, but very real, especially in this world we live in today. So um, I'd like you to and see what most common issues we have are with regards to the seafarers. First, this was very obvious many months ago. Will I be able to leave the ship and return home for my scheduled leave? How are my family and friends coping with the threat and the effects of the virus? Will they stay safe and well? How much risk of infection will I be exposed when the ship reaches its next port? What will be the effect of the pandemic on my company's business and my future employment prospects? And will my cash reserves last till I get my next assignment? Basic worries, but very real. And therefore, we offer some solutions. We tell the guys, first, you have to get as much sleep as you need. Number two, you have to eat healthy food regularly. You have to exercise often. You work to ensure you're capable of dealing with any stressful situation and you should control your consumption of alcohol and cigarettes. Please take note. And if you remember what I told you about the first, in the first slide, couple of slides before this about healthy habits to do on board, to take care of your body. We also tell our seafarers to take care of their mind and their mental state. And part of that is actually basic. It's all here again, we repeat ourselves. Sleep, healthy food, exercise, alcohol and cigarettes. So beyond that, we tell them, and they should remember to talk to family or friends when you're homesick. To take enough rest and balance between work and rest hours. There are plenty of helplines now from organizations, international organizations, mostly religious organizations. I've had many chats with some uh, of these preachers who actually Talk to the Filipino seafarer who's crying to them in Tagalog, talking to them in Tagalog. And they're Brits and they're Irish and they're French. And yet these men are facing them and crying to them about their worries. They don't understand the word they're saying, but they can feel the pain. They can feel the suffering. And, and that's important. We have to tell them there is someone else they can talk to. And lastly, we have to tell them don't exaggerate the situation. Don't worry too much. And watch out for all the things that you read. Sometimes too much reading is also more dangerous than not knowing what there is out there. Basically, what we're saying is that in seafaring, as in 20 years ago when I started, we talked about physical well being. But now we're talking of mental resilience, keeping the mind and the body as fit as they can. So we know that seafaring is one of the most dangerous, most lonely jobs in this world. And it's important to take care of your health. And now during the pandemic, it is even more crucial that the seafarers take care of themselves, both to keep mentally and physically fit. And so with that, there's a happy note. I hope we get to all see each other again in the very near future. We must learn not only to fight against the virus, but also to live with it until that vaccine um, comes around hopefully sooner than later. So thank you for your time. And as we always say, keep safe, keep healthy. 
and now keep happy. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Abaya. If you have questions for Dr. Abaya, please reserve them for the open forum. You may also opt to submit your questions to any of the speakers via the link flashed below. We will also be posting this link on the Facebook live stream and in our chat room here in Zoom. So going back to the first presentation, it's really important that you are cleared of any medical problem prior to going on board because practically speaking, it is much, much harder to get medical help once you are in the middle of the sea. But the one thing that Dr. Abaya pointed out that I think many people forget is that physical and mental well-being go hand in hand when you are working on a ship because isolation, strenuous work can take a toll even on the strongest mind and body. So you really have to take care of yourself. And how do you do that, especially with the threat of a virus? This is where our second topic comes in, preventing and controlling COVID-19 infections among maritime workers and vessel passengers. And this will be discussed by Dr. Arthur Desi Desroman. After graduating from the UP College of Medicine, Dr. Arthur Desi Iroman pursued fellowships in a number of fields such as Biomedical Research Fellowship under the Korea National Institute of Health and the Clinical Fellowship in Infectious Diseases at the Philippine General Hospital. In addition to this, he earned a master's degree with distinction in tropical medicine at Nagasaki University Institute of Tropical Medicine. Aside from being a past president and advisor of the Philippine Hospital Infection Control Society Incorporated, he is currently the treasurer of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases and the overall training officer at the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine Department of Health. Moreover, he is a clinical associate professor at the UP Philippine General Hospital and is the present vice chairman of the Manila Doctors Hospital section of infectious diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Des Roman. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Gusto kong magpasalamat sa organizers for inviting me. And for the remainder of my presentation, I will be speaking both in English and in Tagalog. I-share ko lang po yung aking screen. The topic assigned to me this afternoon is all about infection control while on board, some safety measures, and the use of personal protective equipment. But before I proceed, these are just some of my disclosures. But for this particular session, I have not identified any specific conflict of interest. Just as a quick review, COVID-19 or coronavirus disease of 2019 is primarily a disease of the lungs caused by your SARS coronavirus 2. It originated from a live animal market in Wuhan, China. It was first reported among a cluster of pneumonia cases as early as December of 2019, and it has affected over 33.8 million people globally already. Now, how deadly is COVID-19? With the present data that we have, we are currently with, in a case fatality rate of 3%. So when you say 3%, that means that of 100 people infected with COVID-19, three will actually die. And hopefully, of these three, sana lahat sila ay pumunta sa heaven. Right? But of course, even if the case fatality rate is just at 3%, nobody wants to belong to that group, diba? So it's very important for us to be very cautious and focus on prevention. Because we know that as of now, there is still no effective antivirus that is active against COVID-19. So malaga yung pag-iwas sa COVID-19. Sabi nga nila, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. But the way we address transmission, we have to look at the primary mode of transmission first ng COVID-19. The primary route of transmission of COVID-19 is via respiratory droplets as uh, shown in this slide. So when you talk about respiratory droplets, these are particles consisting mostly of water and body fluids laway or sipon that is large enough to fall to the ground rapidly and usually they do not travel beyond 6 to 12 feet. And this is the rationale kung bakit nagre-recommend tayo ng physical distancing of more than 6 to 12 feet. Now, after they are produced, often they are defined as having a diameter of greater than 5 micrometers. 
So what is the implication of this? Yung distance that they travel and the size. The implication of this is, okay, the way we protect ourselves from these respiratory droplets is number one, via wearing our face mask, and number two, as, Dr. Uh, as Secretary Nogales has mentioned earlier, uh, the wearing of face shield. So if we combine these two, these two strategies, then we come up with a very reasonable, a very significant reduction in terms of the risk of getting COVID-19. For example, kung tayo ay gumamit lamang ng face shield, then the reduction is at 78%. Kung idadagdag natin yung paggamit ng face mask, the, the face mask alone, the reduction is at around 67%. But if we combine the face shield and face mask, then the reduction can be as high as 93%. So again, I emphasize 93%. Mataas po yan. Okay. Now, this picture I just got from the internet, I know that aboard the vessels, uh, medyo nakagawian na natin yung nagko-congregate in a, in a communal area, tapos nagiinuman, paminsan-minsan, pag nagaano, pag nagpapahinga. Unfortunately, uh, these things might have to change for a while, especially na meron pa yung threat ng COVID-19. We might have to continue practicing physical distancing and wearing our mask as a form of preventive measure. Now, in the vessel, it's recommended for us to maintain physical distancing and there should be some form of revision ng ating workplace. Halimbawa, yung kainan natin, yung communal area kung saan nagla-lunch or nagdi-dinner, kailangan merong marker sana kung saan lang pwedeng maupo in order to maintain physical distancing of at least one meter. Because, let me show you the effect of physical distancing. So, yung facial, 78% reduction. If you add your face mask, another 67%. If you add one meter distance alone, it contributes to, a 80, to an 82% reduction in terms of COVID risk acquisition. But if you combine all of these three, the reduction can be as high as 99%. Right? So very, very simple strategies, but if you combine them together, yung risk mo of getting COVID-19 is actually close to not getting it already. So here, is, here are just some of my suggestions to minimize physical contact while aboard. Number one, sana if we modify meal service to facilitate physical distancing, for example, you want to reconfigure the dining room seating, such as in the figure that I showed you earlier, you can stagger your meal times, you can encourage in-cabin in dining instead of going to the uh, community area for eating. Uh, also, let us discourage handshaking and instead encourage the use of non-contact methods of greeting. This is a representation of how COVID-19 spreads in a specific room. So the lungs are affected and the viral particles are represented by the green color. Once an infected patient begins to cough, then the patient starts to scatter the respiratory droplets to as far as one meter. So these respiratory droplets fall to the different surfaces, the tabletops, yung mga high, highly touched surfaces, even the sinks and the faucets and the doorknobs. And this can be uh, another route of transmission of COVID-19. And that is via contact with infected respiratory droplets. And then once we touch these infected respiratory droplets on the surfaces, we touch our nose, we touch our eyes, we touch our mouth, then we can get COVID-19. So it's very important for us to always perform hand hygiene. Paulit-ulit po kami sa pag-recommend, sa pag-advocate ng hand hygiene because it's very important. It's one of the proven methods to effectively decrease the risk of infectious disease transmission. The, the chemical that we use is 60 to 70% alcohol, and we can also use 60 to 70% alcohol to disinfect frequently touched items. So yung mga doorknobs, computers, uh, faucets, tabletops, and you always, we always have to watch out for these germ hot spots. Ito po are pictures of the germ hot spots in the office, but of course, there are additional germ hot spots inside the vessel. Next, sabi ni Dr. Abaya kanina, 
let us try to practice healthy living. And one of the strategies to promote a healthy living is trying to avoid uh, smoking. So you have to be cautious when you smoke. Your cigarettes, e-cigarettes, pipes, and to tobacco can lead to increased contact between potentially contaminated hands, di ba? Tapos ididikit mo yun sa mouth mo. And so the recommendation is try to avoid these products and because the reason for this is when you avoid this hand to, to mouth activities, then you reduce the risk of getting COVID-19 infection. Now, a few more slides. I will talk about 10 steps to mitigate COVID-19 on board ships. So I have tried to enumerate at least 10 strategies. First, you need to train all of your crew on COVID-19 prevention and mitigation. So what do you teach them? Ano yung COVID-19? Ano yung symptoms? So they can uh, recognize kung sakali mang nagkaroon na sila ng beginning signs and symptoms ng COVID-19. Paano ito nahawa? The modes of transmission. So you can actually put posters and educational materials aboard. Paano may iwasan? Paano po yung tamang paggamit ng mask? And that is very important because sabi ko sa inyo kanina, di ba? Respiratory droplet can be prevented by wearing your mask. And dapat tama po yung paggamit natin ng surgical mask. Otherwise, ay nawawala po yung benefit ng paggamit ng mask. So the way you use your mask is the colored side should be out. Tapos yung metal strip ay nandito sa ilong para i-fit. Tapos, kailangan po, when we are wearing our mask, it should cover the nose, the mouth, and a portion of the chin. So, marami po akong nakikita na nakamask, pero nakababa po. Hindi natatakpan yung ilong. Or kapag nagsasalita, binababa sa ilalim ng baba. Again, kapag nagsasalita po tayo, hindi dapat natin binababa yung ating face mask because we defeat the purpose of using the face mask. And whenever we adjust, you have to make sure that you don't, you don't touch the outer portion, the colored area, because that is uh, presumably contaminated. So you only touch the, the straps to adjust or probably the inside of the mask. And when you remove, make sure that you don't touch the outside of the mask, okay? Yun lang pong strap, and then you throw, it, you throw them right away. You also have to teach them ano yung gagawin kapag mayroong kasama sa barko na nagkaroon ng symptoms. Saan po patutuloy yan? Saan siya magsistay? Paano bibigyan ng kapagkain? Paano aabutan ng pagkain? Paano imamonitor yung mga pasyenteng may simptomas? Paano i-disinfect yung mga area na napuntahan niya? Okay. Next, you need to optimize the vessel to encourage preventive and protective behavior. So you need to assign the crew as much as possible to single occupancy bins with private bathrooms if this is possible. You can install visual cues for direction of movement yung mga arrows, or you, you can put there yung mga mar marks to allow for physical distancing. You, can, you have to place hand sanitizers at strategically identified areas in your vessel. These hand sanitizers should contain uh, alcohol that's at least 60 to 70 percent in concentration in multiple locations and in sufficient quantities to encourage hand hygiene. And you also have to make sure that hand washing facilities are well stocked with soap, paper towels, and waste receptacle or air dryer. So this is an example of your, ano ba? this is a no-touch alcohol dispenser. Uh, this is very important to promote hand hygiene, although I know the baka ang impression nyo sa alcohol dispenser is similar to this one. Pwede rin naman po. Basta we practice physical distancing and we always perform hand hygiene. Number three, onboard monitoring of crew and non-crew for signs and symptoms of COVID-19. So uh, a, a list, a checklist might come in handy. Tapos bawat isa po sana ay merong sariling thermometer that they can use to monitor their own temperatures two times or three times a day. And you can actually assign an officer to perform uh, the monitoring of the development of symptoms. You, you need to access, define access and uh, establish a referral system for COVID-19 testing, whether on board or onshore. Also make sure that on board isolation, quarantine and physical distancing are in place. Okay? 
maintaining sufficient quantities of your personal protective equipment, including your face mask and other medical supplies that might be needed in the future. Okay. Ventilation and disinfection are also very important. Frequent cleaning and disinfection, especially of the common areas. Consider the use of HEPA filters or yung air purifiers in case there is really a hard time for you to improve the, vent the ventilation in your vessel. Screening of embarking or disembarking crew and non-crew is also very important. And uh, finally, you need to come up with a COVID-19 outbreak management and response preparedness. Okay, so uh, this is to prevent panic. Okay, ano yung gagawin kapag nagkaroon ng symptoms yung isang pasyente? So ideally, dapat magkaroon kayo ng dry run in case staffing arrangement should also be looked at. Paano kung yung isa ay magkaroon ng sakit? Sino yung hahalili dun sa trabaho niya? And again, sino po yung kukontakin sakali mong magkaroon ng symptoms yung isang pasyente? You might want to come up with a refer referral system via telemedicine providers, sino po yung mga authorities that would have to be informed, whether national, state, or local public health authorities. So remember, strategies to prevent COVID-19 may sound so simple. Yun lang pong in-enumerate ko sa inyo na hand washing, physical distancing, and wearing of your mask and face shield. But remember that there are evidences to prove that these strategies are effective. And preventing yourself from getting infected is also a way to contribute to the global control of COVID-19. And right knowledge and developing a preparedness plan on board prevents unnecessary anxiety. We don't want any additional anxiety for our seafarers, right? Because Dr. Abaya has already discussed the importance of mental health. And yung preparedness natin will also address and prevent us from uh, having troubles both for the seafarers and the companies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Roman. I really like your last point, Doc. Iwasang magpanic. Because, you know, as long as health and safety protocols are followed, your crew are trained on board, it's really possible to go on seafaring and traveling by sea, even in the midst of a pandemic. You know, with your face shield, your face mask, proper social distancing, there's a 99% reduction in getting infected by COVID-19. And two doctors already mentioned it, avoid smoking if you're on board the ship. Now, before we move on, I'd like to remind our audience that they can ask Dr. Roman and Dr. Abaya their questions during the open forum. Again, you may access the submission form for your questions by going to the link flashed in the screen or by scanning the QR code. This link will also be posted in the live Zoom chat and in the Facebook live stream comment section. You know, all our previous presentations all boil down to the fact that COVID-19 shouldn't stop us from living our lives. Rather, we should learn how to live with it and learn how to be smarter than the virus. And so our final topic is going to be about the different national and local protocols that we have in place to combat COVID-19 pandemic. And this will be discussed by Dr. Alberto Ong Jr. Uh, good afternoon po sa ating lahat. Uh, again, I'm uh, Dr. Alberto Ong Jr. from uh, Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians and also me uh, a member of Phi Kappa, Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present yung uh, mga COVID-19 related policies nat natin that are relevant to our seafarers. Dr. Ong, may I butt yeah. in? Yeah. Is it alright if I give our viewers a short introduction? about sure. <laughs> um, what you do. Okay. All right. Also a medical graduate of the UP College of Medicine, Dr. Alberto M. Ong Jr. served in the Doctors to the Barrios program of the Department of Health as part of its 30th batch, where he also served as a rural health physician and municipal health officer in San Sebastian, Samar, having implemented several public health programs, policies, and interventions for the municipality. 
He also obtained a master's degree in public management, health systems and development under the Development Academy of the Philippines in 2014. He has served various capacities under the Alliance for Improving Health Outcomes as an executive director, technical consultant and project manager, supervising and leading various multi-sectoral public health projects in the country. Recently, he completed his Master of Science in Public Health, Health Systems, and Disease Control at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Antwerp, Belgium, under a scholarship program from the Director General for Development. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. J.R. Ong. Uh, again, good afternoon. So I will be presenting the COVID-19 related policies that are uh, relevant to our seafarers. So uh, like Dr. Roman, I will be presenting mixed English and Tagalog. So... Um, most of my uh, the content of my presentation will be coming from these two uh, policies, the DOH, uh, DOH Department Memorandum 2020-0200, uh, uh, the Omnibus Interim Guidelines for the Quarantine and Testing Procedures for All Arriving Filipinos and Foreign Nationals, and also the Joint DFA DOJ, uh, the Joint Circular uh, Number One Series of 2020, which established the Philippine Green Lane to facilitate the speedy uh, and safe travel of seafarers. So isa sa mga naging uh, result ng COVID-19 um, pandemic um, na hindi masyadong na-highlight is the crew change crisis uh, in the uh, uh, in the maritime industry. So a lot of our seafarers are stuck in the ocean, hindi makauwi, hindi at hindi makauwi and then yung mga uh, mga seafarers naman na um, scheduled to go on board cannot uh, go to their uh, places of destinations because of different lockdowns, different travel restrictions in uh, ar around the world. So um, aside from the economic impact, uh, aside from the economic impact, aside from the uh, uh, impact on the livelihood of our fellow Filipino uh, seafarers, uh, given na uh, ang Pilipinas ay isa sa mga uh, top suppliers of seaf uh, seaf uh, seafarers uh, in the maritime industry, um, on the public health um, perspective, hindi um, concern then yung crew change crisis because a lot of our seafarers are stuck in the ocean and they cannot um, stay um, very long in, uh, in, in on, on board because of the concerns on uh, concerns on mental health. So last July. Um, our government created the green lane for seafarers to speed up crew repatriation during the coronavirus pandemic and to provide safe and swift disembarkation and crew change, as well as to prevent the spread of COVID-19 for seafarers, whether inbound, outbound, or transiting. And this is touted as uh, the first in Asia, and uh, the first in Asia, and this is being held as a uh, good, uh, positive development in the maritime industry. And in fact. Um, our government claims that um, since the green lane was created last July, um, are almost 140,000 Filipino seafarers are already deployed aboard international vessels overseas. So um, the, um, the succeeding slides will be uh, about uh, the policies of, on our sea, uh, of our government on, uh, on sea, Filipino seafarers joining a ship dock in the Philippines or overseas or yung mga uh, paalis. And then, um, paano, uh, ano yung mga policies naman natin for seafarers na pa -uwi? And also, uh, oh, what are the policies um, if in case our um, seafarer is um, uh, COVID-19 positive on arrival? Um, there are other guidelines and alg uh, algorithms in the um, government policies that I showed you in my previous slide. Um, these are the um, um, policies on, on transit, uh, seafarers transiting in the Philippines, uh, about the foreign seafarers, and also the algorithm for all overseas Filipinos arriving at a seaport via vessels used as quarantine facilities. But uh, uh, for, uh, for this presentation, I will not be discussing these guidelines. Okay, so first, um, kung ang sima natin ay sasakay ng barko, ano yung policy ng ating gobyerno? So uh, according to uh, the July um, Joint Circular, this is the, uh, the guideline. So our licensed manning agencies should, uh, will identify 
our seafarers who will be joining a ship and provide for land and air transportation. And then the seafarer will undergo COVID-19 uh, testing. And this is shouldered by the agency, uh, by the uh, license manning agency. And then um, while waiting for the COVID-19 result, um, the uh, seafarer um, should, be, uh, should stay in a facility-based quarantine in a DOH-accredited fac facility. The accommodation, meals, and transportation um, are shouldered by the um, concerned manning agency. If negative, the agency will provide land and air transportation to seaport, and then it will also provide the list of relevant government agencies um, supervising authorized uh, rel it will provide the list of relevant government agencies supervising the authorized international uh, gateways. So, ito po yung um, polisiya natin uh, sa, sa mga seafarers natin na paalis po ng uh, bansa. Ngayon, um, paano naman po yung mga pauwi ng Pilipinas? So, um, marami po tayong mga seaman na, nasa, na medyo na stuck abroad and marami rin, uh, marami rin po na gusto na rin, uh, gusto na rin pong umuwi ng Pilipinas. So ano po yung policy natin doon? So base ulit po doon sa guidelines, uh, doon sa joint circular uh, natin. So the license manning agency will uh, also identify the uh, seafarers leaving a ship, submit to respective government agencies um, having supervision and regulation over authorized international gateways. And then... Um, the seafarers must undergo RT-PCR test aboard the ship or at a special designated area in the authorized international gateway, cost to be shouldered by PhilHealth. So, ang difference po nito kung, uh, kung pabalik, pauwi po kayo, ang cost ng RT-PCR is shouldered by PhilHealth. Pag paalis po kayo ng, Pilipin, ng bansa, uh, shouldered po yan ng manning agency. And then, uh, pending uh, release of result, the PHC seafarer must undergo quarantine either on board the ship or in a DOH accredited facility with accommodation and meals shouldered by the uh, concerned manning agency. Kung negative po yung resulta ng ating RT-PCR test, the Bureau of Quarantine will provide clearance to seafarer or licensed manning agency. Usually, uh, usually po um, via email po yung pagbibigay ng clearance. And then the manning agency will submit clearance to PPA or other respective government agencies having uh, Philippine Force Authority um, and other uh, respective government agencies having supervision and regulation over the authorized gateways. And the manning agency shall provide for the land and air transportation of the Philippine uh, seafarer to the point of destination or kung saan po uuwi yung ating um, seafarer. And ano naman po yung algorithm natin kung... Uh, Kung ang seafarer po natin or any overseas Filipinos um, ay uh, pabalik at ang um, point of entry niya ay sa airport po natin. So, okay. Upon arrival, the Bureau of Quarantine will conduct thermal scanning and medical assessment and collect the health declaration card that is uh, uh, that are accomplished by the uh, by the passengers, by the incoming overseas Filipinos and foreign nationals. And then uh, the, uh, the Bureau of Quarantine po will classify if the, uh, uh, if the incoming overseas Filipino should, go in, uh, should go, uh, undergo stringent quarantine or mandatory quarantine. So i, ipapaliwanag ko po yan sa mga susunod na slides. Unahin muna po natin yung mandatory quarantine, uh, yung stringent quarantine. Uh, ano po yung uh, criteria para uh, maklasify na kailangan uh, mag-undergo ng stringent quarantine? So kung sea-based overseas Filipinos po, um, yung, yung ship or vessel has a reported confirmed COVID-19 case or with reported crew or passenger showing influenza-like signs and symptoms prior to departure and or during voyage. And also, um, pwede rin pong maging reason ng stringent quarantine ay yung incomplete submission of pre-arrival evaluation documentary requirements like the latest maritime declaration of health at yung mga accomplished repatriation information sheet. For land-based uh, land overseas Filipinos naman, 
And foreign nationals, um, if they co come from a high-risk place of origin or layover with high level of community transmission, or any, indi or any in individual overseas Filipinos or foreign nationals with influenza-like signs and symptoms will, under, uh, will be subjected to stringent quarantine. So ano pong mangyayari sa stringent quarantine? So uh, under stringent quarantine, uh, the passenger, uh, the seafarer, will be under the Bureau of Quarantines, Bureau of Quarantine. So the quarantine, uh, the QMO at the port of entry orients the um, the pass the passenger on stringent quarantine protocol, and then will coordinate with other agencies in the uh, in the airport. Uh, RT-PCR swabbing will be done and then uh, and then while waiting for the result uh, accommodation will be uh, provided uh, will be provided um, will be provided in DOQ uh, in Bureau of Quarantine approved stringent quarantine facility until marilis po yung result and then um, uh, mamaya po i-discuss ko kung ano po yung mga next steps uh, kapag po lumabas yung result. Ano yung difference naman po niya sa mandatory quarantine? Sa mandatory quarantine po, is, uh, ang passenger is under um, the supervision of OWA. So again, our, our, ang nakalagay lang po dito sa algorithm natin is rapid antibody testing pero po makikita nyo po may asterisk dyan na um, if logistics and supplies permit or under the uh, actually uh, presently ang ini-implement po natin is RT-PCR testing okay okay so um, the passengers will also undergo RT-PCR testing and um, the OWA will provide accommodation for overseas Filipinos under the responsibility of in uh, in OWA designated mandatory quarantine facility kung overseas kung overseas Filipino po under um, free po yung accommodation although if there is an option po to go into um, hotels in OWA uh, na uh, designated as quarantine facility but at the expense po of either the passenger or the uh, or the uh, concern manning agency and then uh, habang iniintay po yung resulta kailangan po magstay yung uh, seafarers po natin sa uh, designated quarantine facility. Okay, pinapakita ko lang po yung result, yung sarili ko pong uh, result because I uh, last August I was uh, I came back uh, from Antwerp. So I uh, I arrived here August 21. I uh, I was swabbed 3 p.m. of August 21 and I already had my result um, on the next day at 9 a.m. and then by um, the same day, August 22, I already have my uh, quarantine certificate from the Bureau of Quarantine. These are all uh, sent to me via email. Ano naman po yung algorithm for all overseas Filipinos arriving at a seaport uh, via vessels used as conveyance or transport, uh, transport uh, vehicle? So, uh, the ship captain and the, sh or, uh, and the ship uh, physician should ensure that the ship has no COVID-19 cases or other infectious diseases at kailangan po segregate yung repatriate crew uh, into individual cabins, ensure room containment protocols, provide basic needs, and ensure male and female segregation. Mamaya po ipapakita ko po ano yung mga requirement uh, for this. Also, uh, to give emphasis po, uh, kailangan pong hiwalay yung servicing crew sa repatriate Filipino crew uh, at dapat po hindi po sila magkahalo and also secure all documents um, like the medical resource, for clearance, medical discharge and etc. And uh, upon arrival, the Bureau of Quarantine po will board the vessel and um, observes infection prevention and control, conducts thermal screening of, all, of crew, medical examination of any suspected patient, review of medical logbook and other uh, other processes and we'll review the maritime declaration of health and other pertinent documents. So, ano po yung mga requirements of our vessels for foreign ports upon entry in any Filipino port? So, um, all arriving ships, um, cruise ships shall be subjected to Republic Act 9271 or the Quarantine Act of 2004. Uh, kailangan po lahat ng mga COVID-19 cases or influenza-like symptoms 
should be reported by the ship captain prior to travel to the Philippines. The ship captain shall submit the notice of arrival one week before the estimated time of arrival. Uh, and uh, the NOAA shall indicate the purpose of call and vessel activity. The ship handling, the agency shall accomplish all facilitation requirements prior to the arrival. And also, uh, the ship captain shall enforce segregation for a Filipino repatriate crew and servicing crew one, uh, upon departure from last port. So, uh, ito rin po yung uh, other detailed requirements. So, one Filipino repatriate crew per individual cabin. Makaiwali po dapat yung babae at lalaki. At uh, yung pong nakahiwalay at uh, nakahiwalay med, uh, yung mga high risk um, crew po natin, um, especially those um, more than six, six years old and above and also with comorbidities or may mga sakit, katulad ng hypertension or diabetes at, at yung mga buntis po, shall be billeted near the ship's hospital or medical clinic. And also the uh, those with specialty shall be billeted near the ship's hospital or medical clinic. Only the service crew shall provide the basic needs of the um, repatriate crew work their regular tasks and function in shipkeeping, and all repatriate crew shall be exempted from non-emergency duties. Uh, the ship captain shall declare also their health profile required by the Bureau of Quarantine. So um, the captain should provide duly accomplished documents, um, as such as date of departure from port of origin, and etc. The ship physician shall submit medical log of passengers and crew, hospital facility capacity, medical treatment protocol, and other respiratory illnesses. Okay, so pagdating po sa ports natin, uh, tatlo po yung pwedeng mangyari, either the, uh, uh, no clearance will be issued if there is uh, there are existing contagion or undiagnosed infectious medical cases on board. Pwede rin po na may uh, provisional fatigue is issued if in complete compliance to uh, the requirements. Or, ang gusto po natin, syempre, the free, uh, free fatigue is issued if complete compliance to uh, those requirements. And then, pagdating po, um, the, uh, the Bureau of Quarantine and the Ship Medical Team uh, shall supervise the RT-PCR test uh, uh, to all repatriates and ensure that repatriates stay in the individual cabins and observe quarantine protocols while waiting for the result. Again po, mamaya, i-discuss natin ano po naman yung uh, mangyayari sakaling negative po yung, case, yung result or sakaling positive yung result. Pero bago ko po i-discuss yun, uh, i-emphasize ko lang po ito na day zero of the 14-day quarantine period shall commence uh, shall commence upon departure from last port of call regardless of port call. So uh, the Filipino repatriate crew shall stay in the individual cabins upon departure from last port of call. Pero ang uh, kaya po rin nakahiwalay siya sa servicing crew is that uh, iba po kasi yung counting ng quarantine period for the servicing Filipino crew. Uh, so dapat po hindi sila nakahalo. And then um, if the servicing Filipino crew shall sign off in the Philippines, their 14-day quarantine period shall commence upon cessation of service. Or if the quarantine period falls short of 14 days, they shall undergo COVID-19 testing in accordance to our existing guidelines prior to this embarkation. And um, only repatriated Filipino crew and signing of Filipino service crew shall be allowed to disembark. So um, kung halimbawa po ay less than 14 days from the last port call, uh, dumating yung, uh, yung, upon arrival po, there, uh, parang less than 14 days uh, yung uh, duration ng uh, trip, the repatriate shall complete the 14 days stringent quarantine in a uh, approved in an approved quarantine facility or in case of mandatory quarantine in an OWA designated quarantine facility uh, counting from the day of departure from the last port of call. Pero again, kapag po um, service crew, mag-start po yung counting sa araw na nag-sign off siya sa, uh, sa mga barko po natin. Okay. Uh, so, Ano naman po yung mangyayari kung positive or negative yung result from sa RT-PCR test result natin? Kung positive, uh, kung positive, so the licensed COVID testing laboratory will provide certification of the RT-PCR result. And then our uh, DOH Health Emergency Management Bureau will um, pick up the overseas Filipino or uh, in, their, in our government term po, extract them uh, from quarantine facility and will refer them to identify the referral facility for further management according to our Department of Health protocol. And then um, our um, sa mga facilities po natin, 
um, the, these, Filip uh, these Filipinos po will, uh, will be provided clinical care and will be issued medical certificate after uh, upon discharge po and with advice of 14 day home quarantine. Kung negative naman, uh, katulad po nung sa kaso ko ne, na negative naman po yung result ko, so I will be provided a certification of RT-PCR test result usually by email and then uh, the Bureau of Quarantine can uh, will release certification na I can discontinue stringent quarantine, uh, quarantine and I um, I can be discharged from my uh, I the overseas Filipino can be um, allowed to be discharged from the quarantine facility with advice for 14 day home quarantine again po with advice for 14 day home quarantine hindi ibig sabihin po na uh, inalaw na pong uh, may certificate na po in my case for example one day pa lang may result na po ako one day pa lang meron na po akong uh, certificate from our bureau of quarantine hindi ibig sabihin po noon ay pwede na po akong magmall um ibig sabihin na po noon allow na po ako na umuwi and i should complete my 14 day uh, my 14 day quarantine at home Again po, so ito po yung case ko before, uh, uh, yung case ko last month. So I was uh, tested August 21. August 22, I already have the result. August 22, I already have my quarantine certificate and I was uh, uh, quarantine certificate from the Bureau of Quarantine. Ang tanong po, pwede na po ba akong lumabas uh, after negative RT-PCR uh, result? Ang sagot po ay sana hindi. Uh, again, we are only allowed to go home and complete our 14-day quarantine regardless of the uh, RTPs, uh, regardless uh, of our negative RT-PCR result. Again po, it's a 14-day uh, quarantine po. So sana po um, pag-uwi natin, kukompletuhin pa rin po natin yung 14-day home quarantine natin. Kung uwi po naman tayo sa probinsya, uh, each province and municipality po may have uh, their own quarantine procedures. So better to ask uh, our the barangay officials of our destiny of your destination for information on the quarant uh, on the quarantine procedures po. Kasi minsan iba-iba po talaga yung mga polisiya po natin sa mga probinsya at saka sa mga munisipyo. At ang mas nakakaalam po nito ay ang ating mga government officials at ang pinakamalapit po siguro sa ating mga pamilya ay yung mga uh, official po ng ating mga barangay at I, uh, I, I, I can confidently say that they are also aware of their own local uh, poli um, policies relevant to COVID-19. Again po, katulad po ng nasabi ng ating mga dalawang uh, speakers kanina, um, I just want to emphasize the, sim the simple uh, public health measures po to prevent COVID-19 uh, COVID-19, uh, the spread of COVID-19. So wear mask and face shield, uh, social distancing po, and uh, wash hands regularly. Uh, for copies po ng aking pong presentation and also the two uh, circulars, uh, two government policies na uh, diniscuss ko po, uh, you may go to bit.ly slash Pinoy Seaman. With that, maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Ong, for the very detailed guide for our seafarers and passengers. Minsan kasi no, mahirap talaga intindihin kapag ka chart lang. And you know what, Dr. Ong, over the past few months, I've also talked to a lot of uh, seafarers who are unsure whether to go on board. And their anxiety is mostly because they do not want to shoulder the cost. And they don't, they don't want to wait for a very long time for their RT-PCR result. And so now, sinabi na po ni Dr. Ong, if you are leaving, sagot po yun ang manning agency nyo. And if you are coming home, pwede po yung sagutin ng PhilHealth. So now, Dr. Abaya, Dr. Roman, and Dr. Ong have already showed us that maritime travel and work are possible even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic as long as we follow health protocols calls and secure proper clearances. And now we move on to the last part of our program, the open forum. I hope that you have your questions ready and you can send them in a number of ways. For those in the Zoom meeting, you can submit through the chat box na sa gilid po yan. If you are shy or if you are watching from the live stream, you can submit through the Google form shown on the screen. You can also scan the QR code to access the Google form. And first, we would like to thank Dole Seafront Crewing Manila Incorporated, a proud sponsor of All Hands on Deck 2020. All right, so we move on to our first question, and this is addressed to Dr. Desi Roman. 
Doc Roman, uh, the question is, during seafaring, what activities as a seafarer or as a sea passenger would you need to avoid to lessen the risk of transmission? Saan daw po yung uh, lugar sa ship where the highest risk, uh, which are considered high, highest risk areas for transmission? So the area of the ship na mataas yung transmission would be an area na maraming tao tapos confined tsaka pangat yung ventilation. So anywhere, halimbawa, nasa labas, outdoors, where there's good air, kami, uh, there's good ventilation, then that should be okay as long as you maintain your uh, physical distance. Kapag ka po halimbawa, uh, Doc Des, for example, it's a cruise ship, are there any activities that you think we should uh, go without muna habang may COVID po tayo? I, I was going through the different Google images trying to to look for pictures na i-demonstrate ko ano yung mga activities but basically it's all about congregation po kasi Oo. so the risk is really about many people going inside or uh, congregating in one area and then there's less than 1 meter distance that will facilitate the transfer of respiratory droplets the inspect the infected respiratory droplets from one infected individual to another. So yung, yung halimbawa, buffet, ganyan, uh, wag muna siguro, tapos yung mga uh, party at night, may mga ganun kasi activities eh, di ba? Lalo na kapag cruise ship, di ba? So every night, there's a different activity, uh, baka hindi muna pwede yun. Alright, thank you, Doc. Our second question is for Dr. Abaya. Dr. Abaya, thank you Dopo for your presentation. In PME, would you have specific data on illnesses that may have been acquired by seafarers working aboard specialized ships such as bulk carriers for coal or wheat and oil tankers? Um, we haven't done that kind of study. Although what we've done are the, um, depending on your position or your place of work, be it at the deck, the engine, or at the mess hall or the kitchen, there are different risks. But as to specific, what are the illnesses, specific ships, um, we haven't done that kind of uh, research yet. All right. Thank you, Paul, Dr. Abaya. And this next question is for Doc, Dr. J.R. Ong. Since government policies and protocols can change in respect to the work of seafarers and maritime travel, where can I refer for reliable and updated information regarding these? Especially po, no, with this COVID-19 pandemic, we have changing protocols every few weeks yata, naglalabas ng bago. Where, where can they ask siguro for um, specific guidelines? Okay, for um, at least um, I can, uh, for DOH uh, related guidance, they can uh, they can refer to DOH um, website or, or DOH um, social media accounts because um, these are all, uh, as far as I know, the Department of Health is always updating, uh, always giving up, uh, updates on a regular basis. I understand po na uh, pabago-bago po yung policy natin, but um, this is also because there, uh, COVID-19 is uh, really, uh, uh, we don't, know everything about COVID-19 at the moment. Marami pong nagbabago, marami po tayong nalalaman um, uh, araw-araw. And in, uh, in fact, one the circular po that I presented to you, the joint circular, according to our friends in the uh, Department of Health, is uh, still to be amended um, soon. All right. So there you have it. Sa DOH, uh, wag po tayo masyado maniniwala agad sa lahat ng mga nakikita natin online. Make sure that you are in the proper website or social media account, particularly of DOH, since they are handling this. Uh, for Dr. Abaya again, uh, since, uh, Doc, you discussed kanina yung pre-employment clearance, what are your thoughts regarding the use of antibody rapid tests in diagnosing cases and you know using it as part of the pre-employment clearance? Is it reliable? Oh. What we're trying to do now, we, we used to do that, especially not um, since we didn't have a battery of tests in early May, but we've switched that already. We found that antibody tests can be pretty unreliable. Um, we've switched now to antigen testing, and since we have our own lab, we're also doing PCR testing as necessary. 
rich that we're going to be going to and we body test All right. that people to go out Switch Thank you, Dr. Abaya. Uh, may we request all of our participants to mute their microphones uh, while other speakers are responding or asking questions. Again, if you have questions, you can send them via the chat box in our Zoom and via Facebook Live. There's a link for our Google Street. Uh, now, this next question is for Dr. Desi Roman again. Uh, Dr. Raman, can you expound on the measures or procedures that need to be implemented right after a seafarer develops signs or symptoms of COVID-19 while on board? So the first thing that you have to do, halimbawa, ikaw mismo ay na feel mo na there's something wrong, you're feeling uh, feverish or start to develop ng cough and cold, Wag na sanang lumabas ng, ng room so you don't contaminate the other areas. So isolation. And then there has to be some form of assessment. Probably not personal, but uh, some other way, some other form of communication to make sure that uh, you are stable enough to, to stay there. Or kailangan ba ng immediate na attention? Kailangan bang ibaba agad? Or kailangan bang airlift? Or something like that. Kasi baka oxygen requiring ka. Oo. Of course, you also have to make sure that there's, sabi ko nga kanina, there should be a, a referral system on what to do in case a test is needed. A test for COVID-19 is needed. All right. Thank you po, Dr. Raman. This next question, any of our three speakers can answer it. Is the practice of steam inhalation or tuob a preventive measure now for COVID-19? And is this medically approved? Who would want to answer it among our speakers? We, we don't have the evidence for uh, tuob or steam inhalation. Ang ibig sabi ang ako naman po ang masasabi ko doon uh, katulad po sinabi ni Dr. Roman uh, wala pong uh, wala pong ebidensya na nakakagamot po siya ng uh, COVID-19 wala pong pumipigil po sa atin na gawin po gawin po yung pagtutuo pero hindi po natin pwedeng i-claim hindi po natin pwedeng sabihin na nakakagamot po siya ng COVID-19 Dr. Abayo, would you like to share your insight as I well? I defer um, to my uh, esteemed colleagues over there who are more exposed to all the uh, different practices there. Um, if I may, um, there was a que the previous question on what to do. If allowed, I I'd like to share um, my screen right now because there is a document which was um, done by the International Chamber of Shipping. Um, our organization, the International Maritime Health Association on protocols, and just, it's a fresh document just released. So it, can I share my screen now? Go ahead, Bodok. Yeah. There, if you can see that, uh, there is a link. If you can take a screenshot right now, this is a 30-page um, document released last uh, September 20, just a few days ago. And um, this is actually what's being recommended to BIMCO and the um, IMO. Thank you. Thank you po, Dr. Abaya. May I ask if uh, Capsec Carlo is still here? We have a question here, um, particularly for Secretary Nograles, but maybe Doc JR can also answer. The question is, why is it that Clark Airport still asks for payments for RT-PCR testing of off-signers while Naia and Cebu covered by PhilHealth? Um, for uh, as per our policy, the uh, the cost of RT PCR uh, should be should uh, should be shouldered by PhilHealth for incoming uh, for returning overseas Filipino uh, workers. Pero kung hindi po overseas Filipino workers, for example, in my case, estudiante po ako abroad, hindi po ako OFW. So 
uh, ako po yung mag-shoulder uh, personally ng cost ng RT-PCR. So as, again, as per our policy, it should be shoulder by PhilHealth. Uh, although um, may option uh, in my case, uh, in my personal experience, ano po? Um, there, um, there's also an option to go in, uh, uh, to go uh, to undergo an, uh, other RT-PCR testing. So for example, um, sa naiya, um, there's a uh, there's a laboratory shouldered by PhilHealth, and there's another laboratory which offers faster uh, turnaround time. So, ayun. I'm not sure, uh, hindi naman po ganun ka-significant yung difference on the turnaround time, but uh, that's what they, of, uh, what they offer. But again, this is only based on my personal experience. Alright, so linawin lang po natin, this is for OFWs. Baka po kasi lahat ng pasahero mag-expect na nalibre sila pag-uwi nila. For OFWs po yung tinutukoy, tinutukoy ni Doc JR. Uh, this next question, um, this is for any of the speakers again. Have you heard of neutral analyte? Is it safe to use it as a nasal spray or gargle? Any of our speakers? I think this is also my first time to hear about this. Neutral analyte. First time ko lang pong narinig. So I guess similar to 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 we don't have much evidence about it. Mm -hmm. All right. JR, JR, narinig mo na. Actually hindi actually hindi pa rin. Again, um on um wala pong pipigil po na gawin natin 'yon basta po hindi po 'yon makakaabala o hindi po maka, hindi po 'yon kontra sa ating mga existing policies on managing COVID-19 cases. All right. Dr. Abaya, this is uh, about pre-employment clearance again. If I have other illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, and asthma, will this compromise my COVID-related medical clearance for work? A little um, stricter with regards to their policies on um, comorbidities because of the high risk involved, especially should they get any um, uh, Co should they get infected with a virus? So the answer is yes and no, because some uh, chip companies are just saying, you can still go ahead if everything is under control, if your asthma is under control, if you promise to lose weight, which is a usual promise we ask from everyone, and if you promise to take care of yourself. So that's basically uh, how we treat them now. All right. Thank you, Dr. Abaya. We have a question via Zoom from Ro and Kelly Pamilar. A question for Doc Ong. Good afternoon. Most of the time when we have positive joiner or joiners, the RT-PCR clinic endorsed the crew to DOH. Then the DOH has no actions on these cases, such as transferring to quarantine facility nor call the crew. Any insight about this po? Mm, uh... I can only uh, share what I know based on the uh, existing guidelines. As, as per our guidelines, uh, if the crew uh, or the uh, returning overseas Filipino uh, turns out positive in RT-PCR test, the result will be uh, turned over to a uh, concerned agency, mainly the DOH uh, Health Emergency Management Bureau, for them to quote unquote extract the, uh, the patient from the quarantine facility and transfer them to the uh, to the treatment uh, to our treatment facility. So that's according to our guidance. I'm sorry that happened to our uh, to our uh, fellow Filipino um, returning overseas Filipino, but uh, that is uh, uh, according to the guidelines that should not happen. All right. I hope that answers your question, uh, Ms. Roan. Uh, we can accommodate a last one to two questions. All right. Let's read this one from Eric Vincent Lucero also via Zoom. Good day po. Throughout my sea service, I have noticed prior pandemic daw ito that we rarely get sick at sea. As for my personal experience, as far as I can remember, I only got ill at sea because of fatigue. It has become a common belief at sea that the salt concentration of the air we breathe contributes to why we rarely get sick. Is there any truth to this belief? Any of our speakers can uh, respond to this again. Um, speaking from, it, it used to be um, one of the 
medical myths many, many years ago, especially those working in the engine room that they would have to take salt tablets. Um, so this is the first time I've heard this, you know, and we told people not to take um, salt tablets anymore because it didn't help anybody, especially when they're sailing at sea. So this is the opposite, what sea air causes. And from basically even our, 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 our grandfather's stories is that sea air is actually very healthy. Um, it's uh, a very pure kind of air really that, that does not, has not shown any um, morbidities to be caused uh, by being exposed to too much sea air. So I feel that this is one of the safest places really to be on deck and breathe all that fresh air. Nothing to worry about. Dr. Des, Dr. JR. Uh, previously, diba, we've heard about stories na the patients with uncontrolled asthma and then they go home to their provinces to take a break. Tapos, they inhale a lot of sea air. Baka kasi mas malinis, diba? Out from the pollution of the city. And it works. Mas nakokontrol daw yung, ano, yung asthma exacerbations. But again, I, these are anecdotal stories and I don't have much scientific evidence about it. Again, uh, again po, no scientific evidence at ito pong sinabi ni Dr. Roman. So, um, we cannot claim that this is uh, true. Alright. Ito na po yung ating last question and any of our speakers can answer this again. Um, this was submitted via the Google form. We have had cases amongst our on-signer seafarers that tested negative of RT-PCR in Manila prior to departure. However, upon arrival in joining port abroad, they tested positive in joining port abroad. How reliable is the RT-PCR test since it's considered the gold standard in COVID testing? Or is there a possibility of false negatives and false positives pa rin po ba, basically? Uh, na lang po ako. Uh, <laughs> Yung performance ng RT-PCR is generally acceptable. The sensitivity and the specificity are acceptable. But the problem is there are a lot of factors that affect the results. So halimbawa, sa nangyari sa kanya na pag alis dito negative, pagdating doon ay positive, hindi dapat tayo mag-come into a conclusion na one of the test results ay mali. One is false positive and the other one is false negative because you really have to to take into consideration a lot of the other different factors, the timing of specimen collection, yung integrity ng specimen collection, exposure during the time na, na, na from the first swab to the second swab, diba? Oo. So really you need uh, somebody who is knowledgeable about the principles of the test to help you interpret kung ano talaga yung nangyari on a case-to-case -face basis. Um, I, I think most of those issues of having negatives and positives is, uh, I agree with Dr. Roman here, and I, I'd like to add, it, it's, it's all about timing. Where, you know, at what point, especially when you start testing asymptomatic patients, it's always a dilemma as to when you are really going to be sensitive uh, for the test. So it may be possible that you may be negative here, but the disease is just forming. And therefore, when you get to other ports, it can be positive. Or even during transit, because during transit, you are not in control of your bubble from the airplane up to the airport. And you know, you, you, you're still, it's almost always a 36 hour trip. So you're exposed and things could still happen. So it's all about that. It's all about timing and also the possible exposure after you were tested. Ako naman po, idagdag ko lang. Um, not really answering the question, but uh, relevant to that. Kaya po ini-emphasize natin na uh, after the negative test, pag uwi, 14-day uh, quarantine pa rin po. Hindi po ibig sabihin na negative test na po ay pwede nang lumabas. Uh, again po, um, we are advised to go home, but uh, advice to complete the 14-day quarantine kasi possibly po na gano'n na uh, uh, yung timing po ng testing uh, yung timing ng testing so pwedeng negative po tayo pero actually infected, infected na tayo and uh, uh, pwede pa po mag-progress into uh, COVID-19 kaya po mahalaga pa rin na 
uh, kumpletuhin po yung 14-day quarantine even if negative po tayo sa RT-PCR test pag, kung pa-uwi naman po tayo. Alright, I know I said that was the last question. Pero ito na po, last na last na talaga because I think this is very important from Captain uh, Winston Lantaho. He is just asking, um, kapag daw kasi abroad sila, they can take medical advice from CIRM in Italy. Do we have the same radio medical advice here in the Philippines where we can seek medical advice for free? Um, I am not aware of any um system here in the Philippines that does telemedicine for seafarers. What we do have, and for example, our group, we usually get calls from uh, directly from the ship, the satellite, um, especially our principals who call us up at our clinic, and we consult. I mean, we've had various calls already asking about conditions on board. So we do have our own private system here. But as a public system that you can subscribe, it, it, there's no uh, system like CIRM or uh, tele, Telenord or even the um, telemedicine system of Aberdeen or George Washington University. All right. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to thank everybody who sent in their questions. And I hope that after the talks and the open forum with Dr. Abaya, Dr. Ong, and Dr. Roman, we have a better understanding of how we can address this pandemic. And like what we have been saying since the beginning of this program, this should not stop us from living, from working, from traveling. Rather, we should find a workaround kumbaga, on how we can deal with this virus while it is still here and we do not have a vaccine. And now to cap off our program, may I call on President Jose Maya Virai of the Phi Kappa Mu for his closing remarks. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. I am Jose Maya Virai, the current superior exemplar of the Phi Kappa Mu fraternity of the UP College of Medicine. First, I would like to thank our broads in the Phi Kappa Mu who selflessly devoted their time despite their busy work schedules. Broad Toby Abaya, Phi 1981. Broad Des Roman, Phi 2000, and Broad J.R. Ong, Phi 2008B. Maraming salamat, Broads, for joining us in this advocacy and sharing your expertise. Indeed, these are very difficult times for everyone. Through this afternoon's activity, we're able to know more about the plight of our seafarers in terms of their health and occupational safety, as well as that of the passengers during these times of very limited maritime transportation. As a formation of medical students, we are very grateful to the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines and top-notch medical board prep for this opportunity to advance the interest of the maritime sector through health promotion and education. This is also a valuable learning opportunity for us, true to the thrust of the UP College of Medicine in molding physicians that are not only highly competent in the field of medicine, but also compassionate and with a heightened social consciousness. Now more than ever is a time for us to work together and transcend the boundaries of our individual disciplines, sharing a commitment to the betterment of the lives of the Filipino people during this pandemic. We hope that this is only the start of more fruitful and sustainable efforts for our seafarers and passengers not only under the helm of the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, but also through everyone who attended today's activity, wherever you are in the Philippines or in the globe or whatever profession you are in. Again, thank you and mabuhay ang ating Filipino seafarers. Thank you very much, Pres Mayo. Once again, thank you everyone for attending All Hands on Deck, ensuring the health and wellness of Filipino seafarers and vessel passengers in the time of COVID-19. This event was brought to you by the Maritime Law Association of the Philippines, Top Notch Medical Board Prep, and the Phi Kappa Mu Fraternity of the UP College of Medicine. This has been your host, Mav Gonzalez. Stay safe, everyone, and no doubt we will get through this pandemic with All Hands on Deck.